Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ozon Owner. I'm an intern with uh, Up to Next. So I'm doing my master's of science here at the University of Ottawa. I'm a researcher and analyst. And when we actually started this project, um, the intent was to conduct a review of the photonics training and education in Canada. Um, but as engineers, I think this is really the wrong way of going about it. If you think about design thinking, you have to empathize with the end user. And well, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, we want to boost the Canadian photonics ecosystem. And how can we do that? Well, we have to look at problems in the Canadian photonics ecosystem. And we found that, well, there's really a, a skills gap. And this study really aims to develop the needed skills in the Canadian photonics industry. Um, and just to reiterate, I really want to thank Daniel for being the pioneer of this project. He's the one that reached out to up to Nick to begin this. Um, Harry for the data scraping, Mustafa for helping with the survey, and Matthew at up to Nick for enabling us to do this work and being able to present at ETOF in Florida. Um, acknowledgements again. Uh, so we used all of these platforms to distribute our information. Uh, so the survey through CMC, Photons Canada, McGill, up to Nick, um, and SciEpic. So their mailing lists. Thank you very much for that. Um, and the, the vast amount of specialists that we reached out to. Um, and of course, ETOP for letting us present there. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on this, but I'll get right to the presentation. Um, so the content of today's talk will cover the background uh, and the current state of photonics training, current industry requirements, hiring challenges and forecasts, and then conclusions and recommendations. So I just want to begin with a, a timeline in history of photonics. And um, the photonics industry in Canada really started about 75 years ago, around post-World War II. And this was kind of the era of the Golden Triangle where uh, it was militarization and we had military agencies, high technology from industry and research um, universities working in, in conjunction with each other. And it's this Golden Triangle. So in Canada, we had DRDC, which was formed in the 1950s. In the US, we had DARPA, which was created in 1958. And this kind of segued into the high technologies that we, we have today. We took a, advantage of a lot of the RF uh, uh, innovations that took place. Um, in the 1970s in Canada, we saw the creation of Nortel uh, and JDSU. And then in the 80s and 90s, we saw great success with government uh, investments like ENO, um, Ozoptics, COPL, and Expo. And then in the early 2000s, of course, we had the dot-com bubble. So uh, with the internet arising, um, need for optical communications, being able to transmit information. Uh, in the 2008, we had a small recession in 2010, we see a resurgence in diversification of photonics industry. Um, so now we see very advanced companies like Zanadu, which is focusing on uh, quantum computing, and Renovus, which is focusing on improving data centers. Um, and that brings us to now, well, 2023. And I think that we're in a very unique position with the ongoing geo geopolitical tensions. Um, and we can't ensure a reliable source of uh, semiconductor fabrication. And we're seeing this with the onshoring of semiconductor fabrication in the US with the CHIPS Act. And you might be asking, well, what is Canada doing? And a big answer to that is that's why we're here today. We're here to augment the Canadian photonics ecosystem. And how can we do that? Well, I really think that starts with the people and getting them the skills required um, to augment the Canadian photonics system. And that's where this study really aims to take us. Um, so just, just a, a statement from a CIPC report so Canada has approximately 400 photonics companies employ more than 25,000 people and collectively generate close to $4.6 billion annually with an annual average growth of 10%. Now that is quite a lot. And I see that with Canada being able to maybe push into the manufacturing sector, Canada can really become a photonics powerhouse and not only photonics, but semiconductors as well. Um, now just to speak about accredited training programs that exist within Canada. So in green here, we see the U15 universities, uh, which are the top universities for research in Canada. And in red, we have the uh, photonics technologist programs, which include Niagara College, uh, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, Cégep, uh, André Laurendeau, and Cégep de la Procatière. Um, and these are all very important because in any lab, you're gonna have technologists that have to be very proficient on certain equipment where engineers are working on the higher level pictures. Um, so they, they work intertwined and technologist programs are almost just as important or as important as uh, the postgrads. And just to note that the, uh, the yellow dot here is where the Uptonic HQ is located. Um, and it's important to note that 
academia isn't the only place to get training. So I really appreciate um, where CMC came in earlier in this presentation. They displayed what kind of training programs they have to offer. And Lucas in, uh, in British Columbia with their SciEpic programs. And I think that is a potential solution to what we're uh, having right now in the industry. But now this study was really focusing on what is the industry missing and how can we augment potentially those academic or those industrial programs so that we can fill that gap. Um, so that brings us to the project background. So our main objective was to identify the skills required by the Canadian photonics industry and identify the hiring challenges, the gaps, methods, and trends in the industry. So our approach was to build on previous studies that were conducted. So we met with Mo Hasanovic, uh, from Florida, and he conducted a study here on the uh, on the right. I'll uh, it right here. I um, mean, he conducted a quantum technician skills and competencies for the emerging quantum 2.0 industry, um, and we were able to draw uh, a lot of the competency questions that they they took and apply it to Canada, but on a much broader scale because quantum is very specific, and we really wanted to cover photonics as a whole. Um, and following this, we did skills analysis based on current photonic job postings. So this is not the survey itself. We scraped LinkedIn and Indeed to see what was most uh, relevant among uh, the job postings. And then following this, this is where the survey came in. So this uh, part of the presentation will pertain to the Canadian job market analysis. Uh, so these are the LinkedIn and uh, Indeed job postings that we saw. So there were 231 uh, public job postings that we saw on these websites. At, and those were under the category of photonics or photonic. Uh, so Harry Kai was responsible for this uh, part of the project. Um, so essentially we pulled web pages and we had mass amounts of data. And of course, because we're comparing data in different languages, we had to convert them to English so that we could be on the same, same scale. And once this was done, it went through what's called natural language processing in which we could extract the skills. So the skills that were most relevant appeared larger in the skills word cloud. And we'll touch that in a few slides. Um, but once skills were extracted, we had to do some type of refinement to ensure that we had the right amount of stop words because some skills can have two words, for example, communication skills, whereas uh, management is a one word skill. So we had to adjust stop words. And we also did a type of clustering. So we were able to group skills together that were closely knit. And we'll touch on clustering in the next slide, but it's something that's very important for someone who wants to get into a specific field. Um, but the top skills that we were able to extract from the job postings were uh, human skills and technical skills. So these were the top 10 human skills on the left here and the top 10 technical skills. Uh, and this was all across Canada. So we see that experience, teamwork, communication skills, no surprise, they're very important. But of course, French and English as we are a bilingual country um, and technical skills. So design, development, software, and silicon photonics, which is number three for technical skills across Canada. So that is a very emerging technology that we can see, especially if those looking to design systems, silicon photonics is, is, a, is big. Um, and just based on that, we thought, okay, mate, we have to look at a smaller scale because we were seeing in the data that there's provincial hubs uh, for technical skills. So for example, in British Columbia, we're seeing that in a lot of the job postings, they need proficiencies in quantum computing and quantum technologies. So we're seeing that there's, there's certain hubs being developed. In Ontario, we're seeing things like product development, test planning, and test equipment. And that ties into the uh, high amount of telecoms companies that are in Ontario, whereas Quebec, we're not seeing uh, very specific skill sets um, because they have such a broad photonics ecosystem. They have a diverse uh, amount of companies um, and we're seeing more human skills in Quebec. Um, but I just wanna say that we're also seeing photonic components here at, at the bottom. And that is a technical skill. Um, and I, I think that's important to highlight because photonic components is the base of the photonic supply chain. They're going to be feeding uh, computers, sensors and telecommunications uh, devices. Um, so while Quebec has a, a very um, diverse photonics industry, uh, it, it is looking like it is at the base of the supply chain based on the, uh, the job postings. And this is what we came up with for the clusters uh, of photonic skills. Um, so essentially these skills are 
skills that are tightly related. Um, so they're co-located. So when we pulled up a job posting, um, these were often most found together in that job posting. So I think this is very interesting to look at because if you're someone that say wants to get into quantum technologies, it would also be important to look in the quantum computing. And if you're becoming a manager, for example, it would be good to look at other skills in those clusters. And I think the clusters are very interesting because they allow us to see what other skills would be required for someone looking to get into a certain field. So for example, um, if you're looking to get into design and development, you may need to know these other skills as well. And I think that might be something very useful looking for, moving forward if someone would want to develop a training program. And this is uh, the extracted skills uh, that we had from the word cloud. Um, and I think it's very important to note that the human skills are most relevant. And the reason being is that they're most transferable between jobs. So while the technical skills don't come up more often, it doesn't mean they're not important. It's just that they're domain specific to a specific company. Um, so things like experience, team player, develop, support, design, communication skills are common to very many companies. Um, but it's, it's interesting that we see uh, very domain or technical specific skills that appear very big, like engineering or quantum technologies and silicon photonics. Um, so in having the word cloud, this helped us develop our survey structure, um, which ended up being into four specific domains. Um, and, and I'll touch on that now. So the key takeaway here is that uh, we were able to develop the survey based on the word cloud. And that brings us to the survey structure itself. Um, so thanks to all of the organizations that helped us, we distributed the survey to about 400 companies in Canada. And luckily we got 87 respondents from 62 organizations across Canada. And that was within four weeks. So qu quite a quick timeline, I have to say. So kudos to all the organizations involved in that. And what the survey structure was, uh, so we took the respondents profiles, so names, emails, locations of work, where they were based out of. And we asked them to assess general knowledge um, in photonics. So things like knowledge of photonics, electronics, optical signal processing, general theory that would be taught uh, in, in academics. Following this, we had uh, four distinct sections, uh, which were branched based on if the uh, respondent worked in that specific domain. So we saw those four main pillars being design, manufacturing, software, and testing. And we'll see those uh, responses in the following slides. And the last part of the survey consisted of hiring trends, challenges, and resources for hiring. So to begin, this is the knowledge portion. And it's, to, without a doubt, no surprise that knowledge of photonics was the most important. But following it was knowledge of electronics, which is very interesting if you're looking at photonics. And this speaks ample to what is going on in the industry because someone doesn't just go into photonics. They have to have some prerequisite knowledge of electronics. You'll have electrical engineers that go into photonics or students of physics that go into photonics. And that's very important to note that there's prerequisites before personnel are qualified enough to get into it. Um, and that I think is the key takeaway here. Following this, we had uh, very specific uh, skills for the design section that came across all about the same average. Um, now, I want to say that rating a specific competency within a category is related or relative to the other skills in that category. So for example, these skills are all about the average. Well, it doesn't mean that none of these skills are necessarily unimportant. It's just that they're all highly desired. So in design, um, component simulation software, layout verification, experience of system design, packaging with things like SolidWorks, or experience in design for testing, they're all extremely important in terms of commercializing products. Whereas if we go to the manufacturing section here, we see that M3, M4, and M5, which are experience in optics packaging, experience in integrated packaging techniques, and experience in quality and reliability were rated highest amongst respondents. And I think this speaks a lot to the commercializability of uh, companies' products. It gets products out the door. 
Whereas if we look at M0, M1, M2, and M6, these could be process specific to a certain company. So things like front end wafer processing, subtractive manufacturing, uh, experience in additive manufacturing, your experience in glass and lens uh, manufacturing processes. And it's not to say that these uh, skills are unimportant. It's just to say that they're not as relevant amongst the entire photonics industry, whereas these are highly valued to get products out the door. Now, moving to uh, the, the testing and software portion, um, we see here that um, in T3 and T2, so experience in analyzing data and characterizing data were some of the most important skills that we saw. Um, and we also saw that, well, experience in installing optical equipment wasn't necessarily the most important. And we see this in most labs because we have technicians that are generally responsible for the installation of equipment, whereas we'll have many personnel in a laboratory that have to be proficient in characterizing uh, samples and analyzing data. Um, so those are the key takeaways from the testing. And software here, we see that S1 is, is very much important to many of the respondents, and that's experience of data analytics. And it goes without saying that working on any project, you have to be able to look at data and be able to draw conclusions from that. And I don't, I don't think this is very surprising. Um, but going out to say that these skills are also relevant to each other here. And I wouldn't say that the other skills are unimportant compared to each other. So for example, experience in managing SQL databases, it's very important if you have a lot of information or hardware description languages, if you're building things like chips is very important, but it isn't transferable uh, across many, many companies in the photonics industry. And that brings us to the top 10 skills that we drew from uh, the previous two slides. So we ranked design, manufacturing, testing, and software skills in the top 10. And the key thing that I want to highlight is that these top 10 skills are most transferable um, and allow for commercialization skills and data analysis. So well, things like analyzing data for testing purposes, experience characterizing optical and photonic equipment, experiments of, uh, of data analytics for software purposes, quality and reliability, these are skills that really help get products out the door. Um, and also the, the human skills. So these are skills that are most transferable and will allow companies to put products out. Whereas we'll see in the domain specific skills, or sorry, these are the, the bottom 10 skills that were ranked. And apologies if I didn't mention this earlier, but we rank them based on uh, the mean. So this, this green dot here. Um, and these bottom 10 skills weren't necessarily unimportant um, but they're least transferable um, between jobs. So things like use, using imaging equipment, well, that could be very specific to a, a camera that you buy. It depends if it's uh, a Zeiss machine or, uh, or whatnot. And similar to the, the other skills that we saw here, they could be very specific to a process. Um, so they're not as transferable. And that brings us to um, a dive into the hiring um, needs. So we see on the graph to the right here, this is the hiring difficulty for all the different domains. And we see that for design, manufacturing, testing, and software, it, it not by much, but it is more difficult to hire for than business development and project, product and program development. And it's to say that these technical skills aren't acquired very easily. And I think that if we look at the skills that we've covered in the previous slides, we may be able to reduce the difficulty that uh, employers have in finding people with, with these skills. Um, and here for this graph on the left here, we have uh, hiring trends from our respondents for the coming years. So we're seeing that over the next few years that more employers are going to be hiring over 10 uh, employees a year, which, it, which is interesting to see that our photonics industry is not only growing, but it's not growing linearly. And finally, um, we analyzed the hiring resources um, that companies used uh, within the industry. And the most common hiring resources are personal contacts and online job, job advertisements. So uh, methods that allow employers to directly reach out um, to employees. And I'm not saying that these are the best, but these are the most common. Um, 
and followed this are contacted directly by candidates and university co-op and internship programs. And there's other programs that exist are, are very good as well. Uh, for example, one of the collaborators was mentioning they set up um, a conference to interact graduate students with companies. And that is another great method to do it. But these are just what our respondents told us uh, were the most common ways of hiring employees. And in conclusion, so the job market, the job analysis found evidence that human skills and technical skills can be sorted in clusters and they vary regionally. So when we looked at Quebec, Ontario and British Columbia, there are technical clusters. Um, and based on the survey, transferable technical skills that can be used for commercialization tasks. So things like packaging, data analysis and verification are more sought across the industry than domain specific skills. Um, and there is a large demand for experience. So will that requirement be a constraint to projected growth stated by hiring managers? Well, that's a question for you. And future studies, well, they should aim to identify how to best fill skills gaps in the photonics job market. That's something that we were unable to do. We were able to identify them, but future work I think should really aim on how can we best fill the gap. And that leads me to some questions for you. So what is the main takeaway for you from the study? What can the photonics industry do to train new and existing employees in the skills that it needs? And of course, do you have any other questions before we go to the breakout rooms? And that concludes the presentation. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Oz. And um, everyone wants to clap. We, I will not be taking questions just yet um, because we are running a little bit behind on schedule and the intention of the breakout rooms was to be able to um, go into smaller groups and to be able to, to meet some of the team who have been involved in that. Uh, we really would like to encourage you over the time that we have left, um, so 15 minutes until 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific, to go around, uh, share your own takeaways and really be able to provide some input on what can the photonics industry do and what, you know, themselves or within that ecosystem to, to train new and existing employees in the skills that we need. So we, we had planned to come back and um, share some of these lessons learned at um, after this session. Because we, we are running a little bit behind on schedule, we will be going out to your breakout rooms. Your moderators will be helping lead this conversation and recording that. If you can stay with us beyond two o'clock, we would appreciate you if you can be there and, and sharing the feedback. Um, in any case, there will be a recording of this presentation and, and some of these notes taken to be able to follow up. But for now, to continue with the discussion, I will be able, I will just about to open all rooms and you will start going out towards the towards there. The moderators will introduce themselves and off you go. Hello and welcome back to the main room. It is 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m in the West and this meeting is officially finished. Um, thank you very much for participating. But for those of you um, that are able to stay on beyond two o'clock, uh, you are welcome. We will try and hear back and record um, by our moderators some of the lessons which were shared within the breakout room. So that this can be kept on record uh, for people who, uh, who will be catching up with this webinar. I understand that um, your schedules can busy, be busy and in respect on, in respect of that, um, if you do have to leave, we will be following up with a link to the recording in the, uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so um, I will uh, invite, um, we will be re resuming the recording. Um, I think it's, it's always good and I will maybe be inviting people between the breakout rooms to, to share some of the uh, main takeaways that, that were heard and um, answers to the question of what the tonics industry can do uh, to train you and existing employees in the skills in Canada. So I'm actually reporting back on behalf of Harry, who uh, was moderating uh, breakout room number two, who unfortunately you had to leave. Um, and in, in this room, some of the uh, messages that uh, were heard was um, that the study itself uh, was um, providing uh, an, a new, well, an additional level of uh, uh, nothing was unexpected, so to say. 
kind of technical skills are there. These are always challenging to be able to to find. That there is a chicken and egg problem of whether we go looking for the talent or the jobs first. And, and one of the challenges is to keep people looking for work in the industry to, to be interesting in, in being part of these companies. I think to the second question of what can the photonic industry do um, in the future, um, it needs to be an active industry uh, for potential employees to see these opportunities. And certainly we, we heard of these trends for clusters to be created. And so these communication and links between these clusters, the industry uh, is, is a way that can help uh, build up that visibility there. Um, there. There is the potential, the opportunity for the industry to spend more money on training. Um, currently, I think there's an ex there seems to be an expectation that academia will train everyone. But you know, how, how far does the investment by the industry um, uh, need to go to be able to also be able to, to reach their commercial objectives is, is a difficult question to ask. So those are some of the messages that we heard in, in our breakout room. I would like to invite um, the next moderator, uh, who was Mustafa. Mustafa, if you're still, you're still here with us, are you able to, to share um, some of the messages which we heard in your breakout room? Yeah, uh, so uh, I think some of the messages that uh, we've heard in the room were uh, the research capacity at, at Canada is very strong, and that is always very encouraging to hear. That means we have a very good infrastructure that we can build from and for both workforce development and for uh, industry support. And in terms of uh, some of the successful things that uh, uh, we are currently doing right now, um, We've had messages uh, about uh, programs like MyTax who uh, support in internships between acad academic groups and university collaborators. And uh, speaking of as somebody who did a MyTax uh, previously, I definitely do agree. And I really want uh, more programs that uh, promote academic and uh, uh, industry collaborations. Thank you very much, Mustafa. That's uh, that summary. Um, I will look towards our next breakout room moderator, Edith, um, be able to come online and share some of the messages that you heard in your room, please. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, it was interesting discussion. Uh, the results of the uh, I, I, I actually was with uh, Lucas from UBC, Dan from uh, CMC and Loic, and uh, there were no su surprises in the results from the study, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, are close to what they see in the industry. Um, so what one of the question was, uh, is the same uh, workforce shortage is, is in uh, in photonics, is it the same workforce shortage that we see in photonics and in quantum, and how is is it going to evolve in the following years? Um, and they mentioned that they would like uh, maybe to see some kind of roadmap for how things are going to play out in the following years. Um, also, one thing that was uh, discussed is that uh, in in uh, in Canada, only uh, fourteen per about only fourteen percent. Um, uh, of uh, attendees in the uh, training co courses are from industry, whereas in the U.S. for the same training, it's about 40 to 50 percent. So one can, one question that is remaining is why is the uh, attendance from the industry in Canada so so low compared to the U.S. for a, a same training? So so yeah, that that was that those were the main points that we had the chance to discuss. Thank you very much for sharing, Edith. And I will turn to my next uh, recovery moderator, Sandra. Thank you for coming back on the video. Can you share your discussions, please? Yes, hi. Uh, so again, for our group, there was a little bit the same observation. No big surprise with the result of the survey. Uh, we were also talking about industry collaboration and their further identified training needs. The, like uh, According to the study, there's different needs depending on uh, where we are in Canada. Uh, so maybe there's a little bit more collaboration we need to do in those uh, that might be help that might help to address the question that uh, there was in the previous group talking about why there's so low participation in our training uh, or like the training Canada is uh, putting together. 
Uh, maybe there's a further to survey or training to see if there's a common things, but uh, customize or maybe uh, also the key for our specific industry. Um, we also talk about uh, other uh, like uh, supporting job that is also as uh, helping the industry, uh, like uh, marketer, uh, legal, so information session and things like that to uh, bring them up to uh, up to speed with uh, the photonic industry, so they are able to support uh, uh, the industry as well. Huh? Um, Thank you very much, Chandra. That's uh, a great summary of discussion. And uh, last you. but not least, I would like to invite Miharika um, to be able to come back on camera and to share with us the discussions in her breakout room. Miharika. Yes, hi. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Devika for helping me with the notes. She shared the notes with me, so that will help me a little bit here to talk about. So in my group, uh, we had I had two participants and one one was Devika so three participants and uh, the two the good thing is that the two, two participants both were directly related to hiring talent and so they had some nice feedback for us and one of one participant was from US and the other one was from Sherbrooke so opinions from both Canada and US and what I heard is that First of all, uh, there's no such surveys in photonics that they have seen. So this is a, it's a very uh, important thing for, for uh, to them, for them to hear the feedback from the surveys and what are the results. That was very interesting for them to see. And uh, so it was suggested that the service could be more broad and more like in depth in one area compared to the, so one of them found that it was more complicated, the survey overall, and it could be more broad and focused on one area at a time, maybe in the future, more to come. And so, uh, and it was also mentioned that there's a lag between industry and acad academia, like uh, the, the hiring challenges. Both of them see that there's quite a lot of hiring challenges because of this lag between the industry and academia. We could not go into much discussion of how to overcome this lag or what to do there. And there was an important thing that was mentioned was the technicians needed in the photonics industry is it's more difficult to hire the technicians and the uh, and to fund the college level programs for such trainings compared to the university level where there are more funds. So that that were the key takeaways from the from the breakout room. Thank you very much, Marika. I uh, appreciate you and everyone for um, taking time to go over the, the 2 p.m. Uh, time slot that we had allocated. Um, I will now stop the recording and take the opportunity 